Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. One of the key ideas running throughout Simone de Beauvoir's voluminous work, The Second Sex, one that she introduces right at the beginning in the introduction, is the conception and the reality, not just abstract notion, but the reality of woman as other. And she begins talking about the very notion of writing a book on women and how that could seem a little strange. She said, a man would never get the notion of writing a book on the peculiar situation of the human male. But if I wish to define myself, I must first of all say, I am a woman on this truth must be based all further discussion. A man never begins by presenting himself as an individual of a certain sex. It goes without saying that he is a man. The terms masculine and feminine are used symmetrically only as a matter of form. So they're not opposites in the same sense as say black and white, right? Where they're both on the same plane. There's, there's something else going on there. And she's going to formulate this in terms of this, this general conception of the other. And she's going to talk about how there's similarities and differences to other dynamics that involve the self or the one and the other. So she talks about woman being defined not in herself, but as relative to man. She says humanity is male, man defines woman. Notice man defines woman, not in herself, but as relative to him. She is not regarded as an autonomous being. And that's one of the key themes that's going to run throughout this entire analysis. There will be exceptions, of course, but she's, she's talking in the general about how things have typically been going. And she's looking back over, over history as well. Now, she then moves to talking about this primordial that is there from the beginning in humanity, differentiation that takes place. And she says, the category of the other is as primordial as consciousness itself. In the most primitive societies, in the most ancient mythologies, one finds the expression of a duality, the self and the other. And she notes too that this is not something originally tied to male and female, right? It's not originally attached to the division of the sexes. It was not dependent upon any empirical facts. But this is what anthropologists looking at various early, we could say historical, because we have some uh, uh, you know, study of them possible in terms of history, uh, historically existing societies, we find these structures emerging over and over and over again. And she, she says that no group ever sets itself up as the one without at once setting up the other over against itself. And she gives some examples of this. She says, if three travelers chance to occupy the same compartment, that's enough to make vaguely hostile others out of all the rest of the passengers on the train. In a small town eyes, all persons not belonging to the village are strangers and suspect. To the native of a country, all who inhabit other countries are foreigners. Jews are different for the anti-Semite. Negroes are inferior for American racists. Aborigines are natives for colonists. Pro proletarians are lower class for the privileged. And so we see over and over again in a variety of different settings, this othering of one group that, 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 you know, or at least individual who stands out as being different, who doesn't fit in. How do women then come to be other? Well, 
Here we're going to start to get to, we're going to get closer to it. She talks about this Hegelian concept of self-consciousness. This is a, a notion that she's taking from Hegel. She says, if following Hegel, we find in consciousness itself a fundamental hostility towards every other consciousness. The subject can be posed only in being opposed. He sets himself up as the essential as opposed to the other, the inessential, the object. So if, we, if we're not yet looking at men and women um, or whatever other sex or gender differentiations we want to make, if we wanted to apply this more broadly, we can talk about us and them, those people living over there in medieval times, for example, uh, residents of the next village over might be viewed as foreigners <laughs> and you might have terrible conflicts with them, you know, quite bloody uh, if they come over to your, your, your point, your town, your point of view, right? They invade your, your space. So what is going on here? She's alluding to this Hegelian conception of consciousness in which self-consciousness cannot exist entirely on its own. It exists through other self-consciousnesses. And yet at the same time, in its primitive state, it feels insecure about that. And it wants to bind the other self-consciousness. It wants to place itself above it. It wants to turn that other self-consciousness into an object, but a strange kind of object, an object which can reflect the subject back to it, the self back to it, and provide it with what Hegel calls recognition uh, in German, on air canon. And this is indeed at the heart of what de Beauvoir is talking about. Women for centuries, for millennia, even up till the present in many cases, are placed in a situation where they're there primarily to function as an object, to reflect back to men something else that allows them, the men, to feel assured of themselves. Um, she goes on and she says, the other consciousness, the other ego sets up a reciprocal claim. When I'm doing this, if I'm self-consciousness and I'm encountering another self-consciousness and trying to impose the structures I would like upon it, whether these be political, meaning, uh, you know, expectations, they're also doing the same thing to me. So she gives a great example. The native traveling abroad is shocked to find himself in turn regarded as a stranger by the natives of neighboring countries. And she says that wars, festivals, trading treaties, and contests among tribes, nation, and classes tend to deprive the concept other of its absolute sense and make manifest its relativity. So we're forced to realize that we also can be other, right? And she talks about a reciprocity there. Now, then she raises an important question. Why does this not happen in the case of women? For example, why, you know, when men uh, give their version of events about what's going on and how the household is structured or what's going on with the family, and then women say, no, no, that's not really the case. Why are they ignored? Why are they poo-pooed? Why are they pushed off to the side? Why isn't there sort of a, a dynamic in which some sort of equality gets worked out where the men say, oh, I hadn't thought of things that way. Uh, I guess I really need to see myself through your eyes, not just my uh, imposition of what your eyes should reflect back to me. Why doesn't that happen? So here, um, she, uh, she says, well, here we go. How is it this reciprocity has not been recognized between the sexes, that one of the contrasting terms is set up as the sole essential, denying any relativity in regard to its correlative and defining the latter as pure otherness? Why is it that women do not dispute male sovereignty? No subject will readily volunteer to become the object, the inessential. It's not the other who, in defining himself as the other, establishes the one. The other is posed as such by the one in defining himself as the one. But if the other is not to regain the status of being the one, he must be submissive enough to accept this alien point of view. And this is a Hegelian conception. Again, alienation, being made uh, foreign to yourself, being made other to yourself. Why do women accept this, she asks as a woman. Now, of course, there's exceptions throughout history, but those exceptions don't prove the rule. So here she turns to looking at this othering or alterity, if you will, and how it plays out in other domains. So she says, there are other cases 
in which a certain category has been able to dominate another completely for a time. Very often this privilege depends on inequality of numbers. The majority imposes its rule upon the minority or persecutes it. And we might add to that as well, um, having an advantage in technology. We could think of the guns, germs, and steel uh, notion as, as well, you know, coming from that popular book. Um, one group, quite often throughout history, is able to impose itself, not just politically, but in terms of how it makes sense of the meaning of, of, of different human beings, it's able to impose those structures upon another. So she gives examples here of, for example, uh, African Americans in, in America, right? Uh, particularly in, in the South at the time that she's writing, uh, civil rights struggle is still, you know, well underway and there's been a whole, you know, history of slavery and then the failed reconstruction and terrorism and, you know, voter uh, suppression and all sorts of other things going on in the South as well. She gives another example of, of uh, the Jews throughout the entire history that they, they have, uh, really, once they're dispersed from, from their, their uh, land. And she says, um, women are not a minority, though. There's as many women as there are men on Earth. So... What's going on there? Is it really the case that men as a majority impose their will on women or they had some sort of technological advantage that they imposed on women? They, they actually live in the same households. So that doesn't make sense. What else? She says, again, these two groups concerned have often been originally independent. They may have been formerly aware of each other's existence. So, you know, uh, before different groups encountered each other, and we don't have to go to, you know, uh, modern conceptions of race, which are just hodgepodge as it is. Let's think about, you know, people in ancient times. You know, at, at one time, the Egyptians were a major civilization, and they had not as of yet encountered, say, the Persians. The Persians eventually conquer Egypt. Many other people had conquered Egypt by that time as well. And you, you could say, well, these groups didn't know about each other. But once they do, then one imposes its will upon the other. That's not the case for women and men. Women and men have always existed. That's the nature of the race, right? We are uh, creatures that reproduce, that, that continue on this, this uh, race that we are, in, in, talking in terms of race as the entire human race, by biological reproduction. So... That's not really that good of a parallel, right? Um, she then talks about women and the proletariat, the working class, right? She says that there's a parallel drawn between women and the proletariat that's, that's valid and that neither ever formed a minority or a separate collective unit of humankind. And instead of a single historical event, it's in both cases a historical development that explains their status as a class and accounts for the membership of particular individuals in that class. But there's a vital difference here. Proletariats have not always existed, whereas there have always been women. You, could, you might say, well, what, haven't people always done work? Yes, but the modern proletariat, the working class, as it's formed through industrial society and, 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 you know, the way in which it arises, that's a historical recent development. Women have always been around. And so, you know, she's going to point out women have been subordinated throughout all of recorded history. That's different than these other others. She goes on and she also says, well, what's the, what's the difference here? You know, another main difference is that um, a condition brought about at a certain time can be abolished at some other time. As, for example, the revolutions in Haiti, right, have proved. Um, but women haven't done this. She says, Women do not say we, except at some Congress of Feminists or similar formal demonstration. Men say women, and women use the same word in referring to themselves. They do not authentically assume a subjective attitude, so they, they don't engage in, in revolution. And, of course, she's writing this long before many of the developments of our own time, so we might consider this uh, necessary to revise. But she points out a, an important dimension to this. She says... The reason why that has been the case 
is that women lack concrete means for organizing themselves into a unit, into some sort of we or the one or the self, which can stand face to face with the correlative unit. Here she makes some pretty startling claims. They have no past, no history, no religion of their own. They have no such solidarity of work and interest as that of the proletariat. They are not even promiscuously herded together in the way that creates community feeling among African Americans, ghetto Jews, workers of Saint Denis, or the factory hands of Renault. They live dispersed throughout the males, attached through residence, housework, and economic condition and social standing to certain men, fathers, or husbands, more firmly than they are to other women. If they belong to the bourgeoisie, they feel solidarity with men of that class, not with proletarian women. And she goes on and on about that, saying that, Up until the time that she's talking about, women have, in fact, not been organizing themselves in such a way as there was something like a general women's consciousness that could stand over and against male consciousness and then demand to be recognized in this Hegelian sense. So another way that she expresses this is to say that the basic trait of women is to be other in a totality Now, the the totality is not a a differentiating trait. Every self and other thing forms a certain totality. But it's a totality in which the two components, she says, are necessary to each other. How are they necessary to each other? Well, in part through our biological relation to each other, right? Through reproduction. But it's made so in other ways as well that are going to go much further uh, into culture, And she says that um, master and slave are also united by a reciprocal need, in this case economic, which does not liberate the slave. In the relation of master to slave, the master does not make a point of the need that he has for the other. He has in his grasp the power of satisfying this need through his own action, whereas the slave, in his dependent condition, his hope and fear, is quite conscious of the need he has for his master. And um, she goes on and she says, now women has always been man's dependent, if not his slave. The two sexes have never shared the world in equality. So there's always been some measure of inequality. Um, She says, even when her rights are legally recognized in the abstract, longstanding custom prevents their full expression in the mores. So there can be a formal equality, but a actual or material inequality. Another thing that she talks about is the structure of society, and she frames this in terms of a certain kind of deal. She says that women now are able to break into the workplace, are able to break into the culture, are able to, you know, take on some of what men uh, held as an exclusive privilege or or, uh, domain. But in doing so, they have to... um, agree to a lot of parts of that deal. And part of that is being the other in the sense that we're talking about. She points out to decline to be the other, to refuse to be a party to the deal. This would be for women to renounce all the advantages conferred upon them by their alliance with the superior caste. So the structure of society, it's not just that there's you know, inequality right here, right now. It's There's a structure that continues to generate that inequality by requiring buy-in by women to that very structure. She then also talks about a certain complicity going on as well. She says that, um, here we go. It's an easy road. On that, one avoids the strain involved in undertaking an authentic existence. When man makes of women the other, he may then expect her to manifest deep-seated tendencies towards complicity. Woman may fail to lay claim to the status of subject because she lacks definite resources, because she feels the necessary bond that ties her to man regardless of reciprocity, and because she is often well-pleased with her role as other. And this is where the existentialism of de Beauvoir is coming out and being manifested. We, we all have choices. Though those choices that we make, they're not always within frameworks that we would choose, but we do have choices. And one of those choices, one of those options, is that of complicity and therefore of sort of ratifying the status of this fundamental division between men and women, making men the self or the one and women the other. 